As I said, today's uh, message, freedom through a new identity. You'll never be free until you discover and embrace and believe what God has done to us, how God has transformed us, and you start walking in that. I, I've been saying, I'm going to say it again today, that there are two powers that are at work to declare or define and mold our identity. The first power is God. God has truthfully declared who we are as his children because he wants us to be in freedom. He wants us to live in freedom. He wants to walk in freedom. He wants to experience freedom. And, but unfortunately, Satan has deceptively declared who we are to keep us in bondage. And he wants to keep us in bondage because when we are truly free, then we're free to also overcome him. So the big reason he wants us to stay in bondage is so that he is free. As long as we are in bondage, he is free. As soon as we are free, he's in bondage because we are able to use our authority and, and uh, in our new identity to overcome him. The problem is, the one we believe about our identity determines if we will live in freedom or in bondage. It's that simple. The one we believe about our identity determines if we will live in freedom or in bondage. God has this wonderful declaration of our identity. And we're going to look at this in more detail today. He declares that if we are in Christ, if we are a Christian, we give our lives to Jesus Christ, if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. We are a new creation. We're going to look at that a lot today. We are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. We are a brand new creation. That's what God says. You are new, depending on what your background, no matter what your family lineage, your history, your generations, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. If you will walk in that, you will have a freedom that you never dreamed possible. Satan has a lie, though. He has a false declaration of our identity, and that false declaration works as a formula that our identity equals our performance plus other people's opinions. He's trying to convince us that if we do well, we're okay. If we do badly, we're not so good. Our identity, he's trying to define our identity by performance, and no one can, can uh, um, consistently perform in a good manner, in an you know, in a, in a, in a overcoming manner. And as soon as we don't perform well, he goes after us and he gives us condemnation and shame and things like that. He wants to convince us our identity is our performance, plus what other people think of us. What other people think of us. And, and if, I don't know if you realize this yet, you, there's no way that you can have everybody thinking good about you all the time. There's no way. You cannot please all the people all the time. It's very hard to please all the people some of the time, right? But if we think that our identity is wrapped up in other people's opinions, we're going to have a rough life. We're going to have a, a life of struggle. So God comes along and he says, okay, the first false belief that comes... Up, see, out of, the, out of those, that false belief comes this, these strongholds. And the first stronghold of the mind is I must meet certain standards to have value. And to be able to accept myself. If I don't meet those standards, I can't accept myself. I'm not one of value. God comes along and he says, through the cross, through Jesus Christ. See, here's our problem. We were afraid of failing. Because I must meet certain standards, I'm afraid of failing and not meeting those standards. And out of that comes this need to perform and perform and perform and do better and better and better. And burn ourselves out trying to overcome failure because we, we want to be able to accept ourselves. Jesus comes along and on the cross, the Bible says he justified us. He justified us. What does that mean? He forgives us completely and he transforms us. He forgave us completely. We don't have to perform. We don't have to be afraid of failure because we are completely forgiven. Our identity is not tied up in meeting certain standards. He has made us into a new creation. Second false belief, the second stronghold that comes out of that Satan's formula is I must have the approval of certain others in order to upset myself. I must have your approval in order to accept myself. But what, comes, what happens as a result is we, we are afraid of being rejected because if I'm rejected, I can't have your approval. I can't, therefore, I can't accept myself. And we become approval addicts. We need, we need people to approve us. If there's 20 people in the room that love us but one that doesn't approve us, that's the one that's going to bother us because we need to be approved. Jesus on the cross, he reconciled us to God. And when he reconciled this, he says, I'm taking away all that barrier between you and God. You are now completely loved. You're completely accepted. You don't have to worry about acceptance anymore because the one who knows you the most, 
the best, the one who knows you the best, has accepted you the most. He's completely accepted you. When we live in Christ, we are completely accepted and we're completely loved. The third stronghold that comes out of Satan's formula is that those who fail are unworthy of love and deserve to be punished. If you fail, you're not going to be accepted, you're not going to perform, but you're also going to mess up my ability to perform, so you need to be punished because you make me look bad. And I make me look bad, so I'm going to punish myself. Those who fail deserve to be punished. So we get this fear of punishment. We're always afraid someone's going to punish us. They're going to look down on us. They're going to do something to get back at us. And we end up punishing ourselves. And we play this blame game. Oh, it wasn't my fault. It was their fault. Because it was my fault, I may get punished. And so we're always blaming other people for our mistakes. God, Jesus on the cross, the Bible says he atoned, or he propitiated in the King James Version. What does that mean? It means he took the full punishment already. We really looked at this last, um, last weekend. You are, Jesus completely paid the price for all of our failures, all of our sins. He took the full punishment. There is no punishment left. And so if there's no punishment left for any of our sins, then when we mess up, we don't have to be afraid of punishment at all. God can only be good to us because the full weight of punishment was put upon Jesus. Therefore, God has no, no, no in one sense, no choice, even though it's in his character, he has no choice but to bless us, but to love us, but to be gracious towards us because the full punishment Punishment for all of our sins was taken on Jesus' shoulders when he was on the cross. So we don't have to be afraid that God's out to get us. We don't have to be afraid that God's going to punish us if we do something wrong. We don't have to be afraid that God is going to somehow get even with us. All of that punishment was put on Jesus. And so there's only a grace, there's only a love response from God now. The fourth false belief that comes out of this... Um, uh, Satan's identity or Satan's, Satan's definition of identity is this statement, I am what I am. I cannot change. I am hopeless. See, what happens is we try to change ourself. We try to increase our performance ourself. We try to make friends ourselves. We try to prove, get everybody's approval ourselves and we can never do it. We can never perform the right way all the time. We can never have everybody accepting us all the, the time. And as a result, we go, well, what's the use then? I guess I'm hopeless. I guess I can't change because I, I'm not performing better than I used to. And we end up saying, well, I guess I just, I am what I am. I'm, a, I'm broken. I'm a mess. I, 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 there's something wrong with me. And so we say, I cannot change. I'm hopeless. We say... We, we don't change, and we say, well, the reason I didn't change is because there's something wrong with me. Not that I did wrong, but I am wrong. Do you see the difference? Not that I did something wrong, not that I messed up, but that I am a mess up. Not that I failed, but that I am a failure. That's what happens. We, we start to believe there's something intrinsically wrong at the core of our being. You know, and we experience shame a lot more than we realize. We do something wrong, we realize it was wrong, we feel shame. But also, somebody else does something wrong to us, right? We, didn't, we were not doing anything wrong at all. Someone else did something wrong to us, and then suddenly we feel shame. Why? Because we think, well, we must have been partly at fault for them to do that to us. You know how many preteen children that were sexually abused that are thinking, I must have done something wrong for them to be attracted to me and abuse me. And so these children are walking around going, there's something wrong in me. Otherwise, that man would never have did what he did to me. Or a girl that was raped. I must have done something wrong. Otherwise, he never would rape me. Or I got sick. I must have done something wrong. Otherwise, they never would have got sick. And so we're always, all this stuff comes against us. We're always experiencing shame. Because of this belief that I am what I am, I cannot change. I am hopeless. Our problem is we're afraid of shame, and yet we end up experiencing shame all the time, and we end up having feelings of hopelessness. I cannot change. Shame is like the mother of all strongholds. People 
who struggle with shame either consciously or subconsciously believe that they'll never get to experience any joy in life. They'll never get to experience the happiness that other people do. They believe that their identity is completely defined by what they do or what they don't do. And so, as I said, it's not just that I did something wrong, but I am wrong. Not that I failed, but I am a failure. Not just that I'm a me I messed up, but I am a mess up. At the core of their identity, they believe there's something just wrong inside of them. Let's look at... Let's look at the shame test. Do I struggle with shame? Most of you already know, but here's some questions to ask yourself. I often think about past failures or experiences of rejection. You know, a lot of people spend most of their days just thinking about their failures, just rehearsing their failures over and over again. Times when they failed, times when they were rejected, times when they experienced pain, and they just think about it over and over again. That's part... That's a symptom that you are struggling with shame. Number two, there are certain things about my past that I cannot recall without experiencing strong, painful emotion. See, wh why does this happen? Why do we, we think of the past and suddenly have all these painful emotions that come into our heart? Why is that? Because we've not overcome the lies based upon those experiences. Because every time you have a painful experience, if you're not careful, you'll believe a lie. And so when you think of the negative experience from the past, the lie is reminded of you. You're reminded of the lie, and you experience the pain all over again. Because suddenly the lie is connected to the experience. So every time we think about our past, we experience the pain associated with the messages that those lies send out. I seem to make the same mistakes over and over again. See, because when we make mistakes over and over again, it's because our identity is so tied to those mistakes that we come to believe that we cannot do anything other than make those mistakes. And so as soon as a situation occurs, we're in order way we, th we think in our head, oh, well, this is the way I'm going to mess up this time. And we end up repeating our mistakes. Because if we believe that our identity is tied to those mistakes, we'll end up making those mistakes over and over again. Because we live out of our identity. Number four, there are certain aspects of my character that I want to change, but I don't believe I can e ever successfully do so. You know, we know a certain behavior is wrong, like jealousy or rage or um, an addiction or whatever. But we believe that we're stuck with those behaviors and we can't overcome them. When we, when we do that, then basically that behavior has become so identified with who we are and our identity that we think that our behavior is who we are. I am a rageaholic. Not that I have a problem with anger, but I am a rageaholic. Not that, that I, uh, uh, I struggle with alcohol, but I am an alcoholic. I just, uh, I, I have a pet peeve there, but anyway. But whatever your, see, if you identify with your behavior and you believe that's who you are, you cannot act otherwise than that behavior. And that's why I encourage people, don't ever say, I am an alcoholic. Don't ever say, I am a drug addict. Don't ever, you know, say, no, I struggle with, an, I struggle with temptation of drugs. But that's not who you are. See, because if you believe that you are an alcoholic, then by definition you must drink. Because that's your identity. But if you believe you struggle with alcohol, but Jesus is setting you free, then you don't have to always drink. It's, it, you can say, well, that's just, you know, playing with words. No, it's not. It's, it goes to the core of our identity. It goes to the core of our identity. I'll throw this out. It'll be on the video. Who knows? People will be mad at me tomorrow. But anyway, don't ever call someone a homosexual. There's no such thing. God only made men and women. There are people that struggle with the temptation of homosexuality, attraction to the same gender. Some people call that gender confusion. But there's no such thing as an homosexual, because if there were, we would have to immediately say, God created three, three types of beings on this world. No, he didn't. So there's no such thing as a homosexual. There's no such thing as a lesbian. There are only people that struggle with their identity in the area of their sexuality. See, we've got to get our thinking straight on these issues. 
Moving on. <laughs> I feel inferior. <laughs> Not me personally, but I feel inferior. It's like, it's like people that struggle with shame think that they're less than other people. They, they, they you know, because... Now, here's the thing. Inferiority is actually very deceptive because if you feel inferior, then often what you'll do is you'll strive to overcome. You'll strive to prove yourself you're, that you're better than people think you are. And so a lot of, actually a lot of successful people are actually struggling with inferiority. They're very successful, but when you talk to them, they say, I'm a mess. Interestingly, um, you know the uh, people who struggle most with self-esteem? the profession that struggles most with self-esteem, with feelings of inferiority, are the bottles. The beautiful models. Because they think there, there's, there, I'm not as, there's a blemish, there's something wrong, I, my nose is a little bit out, or my, my, whatever, my big toe's too big, or whatever. And they struggle so much with inferiority. Because they're always comparing themselves to others. And you know, here we are looking and say, well, beautiful people, they're going, oh, I'm so ugly, I'm so blemished, I've, I have all these uh, um, defects. Inferiority. There are certain aspects of my appearance that I cannot accept. There are certain aspects of my appearance that I cannot accept. You know, there are some things about our, our appearance that we can change. Like, if, you know, if your teeth are a little bit out of shape, you can get some braces, or you can do some weight loss stuff, or you can do some exercise. But when you, when you can't accept your basic appearance, there's a problem with shame. Okay? I am generally disgusted with myself. See, we don't need others to be angry with us or hate us, because we hate ourselves. We're disgusted with our behavior. We're disgusted with our attitudes. We're disgusted with, 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 with the, our, you know, our basic deportment in life because we have this issue of shame. We hate our thought life. We hate just about everything about ourselves. Well, that's shame. That's shame. Number eight, I feel that certain experiences have basically ruined my life. We'll believe we'll never be made whole, we'll never succeed, we'll never um, be able to get on in life because of certain experiences. We were publicly humiliated, or we were sexually abused, or we, were, we experienced a divorce, or our father died, someone close to us died, or some other painful experience, and when that happened, we just got stuck and thought, that's it. I'll never be able to move on in my life. There's an issue of shame there. Number nine, I perceive myself as an immoral person. You know, because of all my past failures, I must have an immoral lifestyle. There must be something wrong with me, and God isn't pleased with me, so he's not going to bless me. That's a shame issue. Number ten, I feel I've lost the opportunity to experience a complete and wonderful life. I'm, I'm just shocked at how many Christians say, well, if only I made it, had to make different choices early in life, things would be different, but now I'm just stuck. I'll never be able to experience the joy that other people have. I'll never be able to experience the satisfaction in life. I'll never be able to experience, and then you fill in the blank. That's an issue of shame. See, because that, that's Satan's biggest lie. That because of what we've done wrong, then we are now never, there's no makeup, there's no, there, there's no, turning things around and we'll never going, we're never going to be able to experience the joy that everyone else gets to experience. It's not, it may be for them, but it's not for us because we just did something too wrong. Those are all beliefs, those are all struggles, they're all mindsets, thoughts that come out of that shame mindset. If you, if you can relate to some of these, you need to get set free of shame. Some of the effects of shame, very quickly, inferiority, we already talked about that. Just other people are better than us, more successful than us, smarter than us. Habitually destructive behavior. We just can't seem to st stop doing that thing. Three, self-pity. We're always feeling sorry for ourselves. Number four, passivity. Uh, um, we believe there's nothing we can do right, and therefore it's better to just do nothing. And that way we can't do anything wrong. Numbers. Five, isolation and withdrawal. We just don't want to be around a anyone. We don't, you know, even if people love us, we just f we feel too ashamed to be around them. We just withdraw from people. Number six, loss of creativity. Because of shame, we have the difficult time expressing the creativity that God put within us. 
Number seven, codependent relationships. We come to believe that we need other people to take over parts of our lives so that we can cope. And so we just lean heavily on other people. Number eight, despising our appearance. We talked about that. You just can't stand how you look to yourself. And number nine, much regret. You keep thinking, if only I'd done things differently. If only, if only, if only, if only. And, you know, it's just constant repetition. The good news, God has a solution to shame. See, the, the four biggest things that we struggle with, Jesus created a solution on the cross for us. The solution to shame is regeneration. It's Titus 3, 5. According to God's mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. See, most people don't understand this word regeneration. What is regeneration? Regeneration has to do with God changing something on the inside of us, at the core of our being. It's, regeneration isn't just washing. Regeneration goes to the core of our being and actually changes something deep inside so that we're made completely new or made a completely brand new uh, person with a brand new identity. The word translated regeneration, do I have it there? Yeah. The word G regeneration from, comes from a Greek word palygenesia palygenesia, from which we get our word genesis. It literally means, well, we, we translate that sometimes as new birth or spiritual birth, but it literally means to experience a brand new nativity or a brand new genesis. The word regeneration means to have, to personally experience a, a, a nativity or a brand new genesis. Something totally recreated from the inside out. Something brand new. And as we said, it's basically becoming a new creation. Second Corinthians 5.17, there if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Brand new creation at the core of your being. The old is completely gone, the new has come. Okay. See, God, God's provision was not to cover our old sins and clean up our old nature, which was bent towards sin and, and is shame-filled. Instead, God's provision is replace that old nature with a brand new nature, a divine nature that's just like his nature, so there's an intermingling and identifying with his nature. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4, Christ has given us his very great and precious promises, so through them you may participate in the divine nature. You may experience the new nature, a brand new nature that's the same as God's nature. Uh, regeneration, a new genesis, a new creation, a new nature, changed at the core of our lives. But here's the trick. Satan uses shame. How does he use shame? Well, let me ask you three questions. What's more powerful, your sin or God's ability to do with your sin? God's ability. Certainly, we know this. Can man's sin be superior to the Christ payment for that sin? Of course not. Jesus paid the full price, paid the full penalty. Can God, who spoke the universe into existence, change your life? Yes. See, we know this. But Satan uses shame to counteract the truth. See, what happens is, when we believe Satan's lie of shame, that we are what we are, we cannot change, that we're hopeless, then we're believing that not even God, who created the worlds with a world, with a word, can do anything in our life. That God, those things may be true for everyone else, but not for me. But the problem is millions of Christians are thinking, I'm the problem, right? And so it's like, really, we're the problem. But we don't realize how many other people are struggling with the same issues of shame. But then what happens, because we believe that God may, God's work may work in everybody else, but not in us, then when God's grace comes to us, we don't accept it. We don't work with it because we think it's not going to work for us. Okay? And we've got to cooperate with God's work in our lives. And so we just reject God's grace as it comes. We think, well, it's not going to work for us. It only works for other people. That's how Satan uses shame. 
that truth will work in me because there's something wrong with me. The truth is that God has already did something at the core of your life if you're a Christian, and he wants to teach you how to release it into the fullness of your life, into the totality of your life. James chapter 1, verses 23-24. If anyone is a hearer of the word and, does, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, and then he goes away, and immediately he forgets, I love this translation, he forgets what kind of man he was. See, the, if we... It, James is telling us that if we hear the truth but we don't do it, if we don't let it change the way we live, it's not because we're an evil person, it's because we've forgotten who we are. Because if we knew who we are, we would live that new truth. The problem is not with our condition, the problem with, is with our perception of our identity. And we don't live the truth that we receive. It's because we've forgotten what kind of man God has, or what kind of woman God has recreated us into being. Let's talk about spirit, soul, and body for, for a couple minutes, how they work together, okay? At creation, second, second, well, the First Thessalonians chapter 5, 23, God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. God created us at creation, as, as we are a spirit, I remember Lucien used to say this all the time, we are a spirit who has a soul and lives in a body. We are not a body, we live in a body. We are not a soul, we have a soul, but we are a spirit. Okay? At creation, God gave us a spirit, and with that spirit, we communicate with God. With our soul, we think with our mind, we choose with our will, and we feel with our emotions, our soul. And with our body, we relate to the physical world around us. This was God's design for us at creation. That with our spirit, we have authority over our soul, and as a result, our body just kind of obeys what our spirit and soul are telling it, right? Unfortunately, after the fall... Bible says our spirit became dead to God, right? Ephesians 2, 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions. Well, our body wasn't dead. It was doing the sinning, right? Our soul wasn't dead. We were having those inappropriate emotions and those wrong thoughts and making bad choices. Our soul was really alive. Our spirit was dead, Okay. Our soul started to wrestle control. Because our spirit was dead, our soul now, with its mind, will, and emotions, was wrestling for control of our lives, or, or our bodies. And, and our soul wrestled, usually through our emotions. We were controlled by our emotions. Or, but for a few people, they, they tried to distance themselves from their emotions and tried to live a completely intellectually a life and, and disconnect from their emotions. And our physical body... And its appetites were just putting demands on our person. I want this. I want this. And so there's this war going on between our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and what the body wanted, and what the body wants. Okay, constant battle. Then at salvation, our spirit, our old spirit, is gone. We are given a new spirit. Ezekiel twenty-six thirty uh, thirty-six twenty-six. I will give you a new heart. And it will put a new spirit in you. A new spirit. At salvation we get a new spirit. And that new spirit, because it's fused with the Holy Spirit, will guide us into all truth if we let it. If we let our spirit take control of our, of our lives. That new spirit will guide us into all truth. Okay. Problem is... Our old intellect, will, and emotion still surround that new spirit. 
See, people say, I don't understand. If I'm really a new creation, how come I'm still struggling? Because although you have a new spirit, that old soul that's been in control of your life for years and years, is that old intellect, that old way of thinking, all those old thoughts, and those, the, our old will, our old choices, and our old emotions are surrounding your spirit and trying to smother your new spirit, trying to battle for and win control of your life. Okay? <clears throat> And the body is still putting pressure on our soul and our spirit because it was used to getting its way, right? Our body was used to getting its way. So it's putting pressure on our soul and our spirit. Our soul is trying to smother our spirit. And so we're still battling inside, even though we're now a new creation at the core of our lives. But what God wants to do, and here's where we have to settle today, that God's solution... See, if we allow our spirit to take dominance over our soul, if we feed our spirit, if we believe the truth of God's word, if we receive the grace that God has for us, then our spirit starts to become stronger, our new spirit becomes stronger, and it starts to take, starts to take dominance over our soul and transform our soul. And then our soul, our old intellect, will, and emotions, they become transformed by the new spirit that God's placed within us that's in alignment with his spirit and his spirit of truth that's aligning our lives with, with truth, right? And leading us into all truth. And then our body just submits to the new spirit and the transformed soul. Most of us in this, in this room here and on, probably on the internet, are somewhere in this place where we're learning or we're praying or we're hoping that our new spirit that God put within us will learn how to fully take dominance over our, our soul and slowly transform our mind, will, and intellect, our thinking, our feeling, and our choices. And that body, we're just, it's still in the way, kind of, but we're going to get there and take control over that body, okay, as our soul is transformed, okay? And that's what this verse talks about. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world, physical weapons. On the contrary, they have divine power, spiritual power, to demolish strongholds, those false beliefs. Remember I said a, a stronghold is a group of thoughts working together to form a stronghold that becomes harder to, to fight against. And so the weapons that God has for us have divine power to demolish those lies of Satan, those, those, those false beliefs. How do we do that? By taking those thoughts one at a time and those pretensions, those lies of Satan that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God? The truth that God's trying to give us, the truth of who we are in Christ, and we take captive every thought. You see the battles in the mind. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ, okay? We're trying to submit every thought to God, every thought to Christ, and say, is this a true thought or not? And if it's a true thought, we embrace it. If it's not a true thought, then with God's grace, we reject the thought, okay? The battle's in the mind. And that's how we demolish strongholds. We start by dismantling individual thoughts. And if your stronghold has five different thoughts in it, when you break off all five thoughts, the, the stronghold just falls apart. Okay. So in Christ, we are a new creation. That's, that's the bottom line I want you to get today. See, we think, well, what's the difference really between my old life and my new life? What's the difference between who I used to be and, and this new creation I'm supposed to be? And in our thinking, we say, well, I don't see much difference. But in reality, the reality is there is, is astronomical difference that, well, that was, wow, that's a bigger word than I'm used to using. There's a big difference between, a lot of difference, a radical difference between our old creation and our new creation. God said we're a new creation, we have a new identity, and that new identity is radically different than our old. Look at this. I hope you get this one. For once, re, Ephesians 5 Verse 8, for once, not for once you were in darkness, but for once you were darkness because your old nature was full of darkness. You, for, 
At one time, your identity was darkness. But now, not that you are in the light, but you are light because you're in the Lord. What a difference. At your very core, you used to be darkness. Now at your very core, you are light. You are completely and radically different. And then Paul says, now learn how to live as that light. Learn how to live out of your new identity. You are children of light because you are light. And God is light. And in him there is darkness, no darkness at all. So you are a child of light because God is light. You are radically new and different in your life. But if we walk around thinking we're still that old person, then we'll live like that old person. If you think you're a dog, you will act like a dog, even though you're not a dog. See, until we train our thoughts to be consistently aware of the fact that we are a new creation with a new identity, until we train our thoughts to consistently believe that and think that, then we will not see any difference in our lives. Do you get that? We have to train our thoughts to say, I am a new creation. I am new. I am forgiven. I am reconciled. I am justified. I am redeemed. I am regenerated. I am a brand new creation. Until we train our thoughts to think that way, we will, to, we will struggle. Simple as that. God has called us to rule. God has called us to have authority and power over all of creation and to advance the kingdom uh, for him, but we'll never fulfill our role until we discover who we really are. See, <laughs> I wish I could have you all stand in front of me for a minute, eye to eye. You, you are already so powerful. You are already so powerful. But if you don't realize it, you won't see it. If you don't realize it, you won't see it. See, some of you, I said that, some of you, yeah, well, yeah, not me. That's shame. I am what I am. I cannot change. I am hopeless. You're just resisting. That lie is resisting the truth that you are a powerful person. You are light. You are a new creation. And Satan is so fearful that you'll actually stand up and use your power and use your authority over him, that he'll do anything he can to keep you ignorant. And the best way to do that is to keep speaking these lies in your head. Just keep saying the lies. And we, like Eve, Eve's sin, <laughs> Eve's real sin was not partaking of the fruit. You know that? Eve's real sin was entering into a dialogue with Satan. Because as soon as you enter into a dialogue with Satan and start talking to him and let him questioning things, you're already done. Right? You've already lost. The fruit that Eve took was a consequence of her actually talking to Satan and, and Satan trick her with his words. And so Satan will do anything he can to keep us ignorant of who we are in Christ. And that's why he keeps telling us lies. And, and, and until we tear down those lies, those strongholds in our lives will just keep us powerless, even though we're already powerful people. Now, how do we turn God's truths into our truth and get them in our heart and get them to transform our mind? We're going to spend all of next Sunday looking at that one issue. How do we let God's truth change us? How do we get these lies out of our head and how do we really get God's truth into our heart and, and our head? It's going to take a whole lesson to do that. But right now, I just want to tell you what is already true about yourself. You are atoned for. You are already atoned for. Actually, that's the wrong title, isn't it? Did I put the wrong slide up? This is terrible. It's not that. You are regenerated. I'm sorry. You are regenerated. Wrong slide. But the rest is true. You are a new, complete creation in Christ. Okay? You have been regenerated. You have experienced a new genesis in your life. And you're now a new, complete creation in Christ. You are now f deeply loved, completely forgiven, fully pleasing, and fully accepted by God. 
what you are now is created by God himself. And so there is no need for any shame in your life because God has created something perfect with inside of you. He's created a brand new creation. You are light. There's no need, no, no reason for shame at all. And number four, your new identity is unique, original, and specially designed by God for a specific purpose, which you are completely equipped to fulfill. If you would get it, if you would realize who you are in Christ. You are something crafted and formed and shaped by God himself. He put a new spirit with inside of you. But now we have to feed that spirit. And we do that through God's truth. You are a new creation if you are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, how do you become a new creation? We've been talking about this the last four or five weeks. Number A, A you just acknowledge your sin. You just acknowledge the fact that in me is sin and I am a sinner. And I need help. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah 59 verse 2, your sins have separated you from your God so that he cannot hear you. Acknowledge, you accept your sin, number or B, you believe in Jesus, God's solution. You just basically say, God, you've told me what my condition is. What's the solution? The solution is Jesus. I believe in Jesus, God's solution. If you confess with your mouth, Romans 10, verse 9, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. You just embrace the truth of what Jesus has done for you. God's solution was to pay the price on the cross for our sins, for our shame, for our rejection, for all those things. And we embrace Jesus and we get to experience the benefits of what he did. See, we confess our sins and we receive that forgiveness that was paid for 2,000 years ago. Can you get that in your hearts today? Well, you don't know what I've done, Pastor Dave. No, no. Jesus paid for everything you did and will yet do 2,000 years ago. You're so concerned about your present sins and your future sins. And and Jesus said, I paid for all of that 2,000 years ago. So you just see. You confess, yes, I sinned, and I receive forgiveness. And number four, I depend on God to do what he promised to do and give me that new life, put a new spirit with inside of me, make me into a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He's experienced a new genesis. He's had a nativity in his spirit, and he now has a new spirit. He is brand new. He is no longer darkness. He or she is light. That's who we are at the core of our beings. A brand new creation. A brand new creation. Let's just bow our heads for just a second. Just want to make sure that the, now's an opportunity by internet or here in the room. If you've never said, Jesus, come into my life. If you've never said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need to believe what you've done. I need to confess my sin and just, ex- and just depend on you to make me a new creation. Stop depending on yourself. Stop depending on your good works. If you want me to pray for you at my own prayer time at home, I just want you to raise a hand for a second, put down again. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, okay, thank you. Give you about ten more seconds. Okay, thank you. I'm going to pray at home. I'm just going to pray quickly right now. Father, thank you for these that have responded and those online that have responded. Lord, right now, they've already done the confessing. They've already done the acknowledging. They've believed that you have the solution, and that's why they raised their hand. And so now, Lord, I'm just trusting in you. I'm depending on you to do what you've promised to do, and I know you're faithful and true, and you're recreating them at the core of their lives right now into a brand new creation, a brand new creation. And as, as they started off depending on you, Lord, I pray you will help them to depend on you the rest of their lives to trust you to do what only you can do. Lord, we continue to resolve to walk in grace and respond to your power in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's the truth. You are... Regenerated, not atoned for. You're, although you're atoned for too, you're now regenerated. You've had a new genesis. And, and, and some of you have heard the message, 
And, and, and you, need, you just need to hear those words over and over again. You have been regenerated. You're a new creation. And so we're going to open up the altar now. Um, a prayer team standing ready to pray for you. If you um, don't need prayer for this, you, the, the refreshments will be out in just a second. Uh, in about 15, 20 minutes, I believe there's going to be our healing team and our prophetic team. You can see Carol for that ministry. But if you would like special prayer, and all the team is going to do is just declare these, right? We're not going to get off into some weird tangents. We're just going to declare you are a new, a completely new creation in Christ. You are now deeply loved, completely forgiven, fully pleasing, and totally accepted by God. We're just going to declare these things over you today. The prayer team is going to declare these things, and we're going to get them through your ears into your spirit, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the truth of God's word, okay? So, Father, in Jesus' name, those that need prayer, I just pray that you come forward, and the rest, we'd be a little bit quiet as we re in enjoy the refreshments today, and I just pray for the two prophetic team, the prayer team, the, ministry, the healing team. God, you use them mightily to, tr to see people healed and transformed today in Jesus' name.